what I'd like to do is to talk with you about a few principles of cognitive psychology, just a few principles of cognitive psychology that I think if every presenter just knew these things and you thought about them the next time you design slides, you would be so much further ahead of what people are typically doing. All right, so let's, let's start there. First one, if I have a speaker and an audience, and right now I'm a speaker, right? You're my audience. Your brain is having to process the words that are coming out of my mouth. In addition, your brain is having to process any words that I might put on the slide. Now, we've all seen plenty of slides that look like the one pictured on the screen there, right? Content doesn't matter at all. Just look at the form of the slide. You've all seen plenty that look like that. And here's the question I'd like to ask you, and I'm actually going to take a few responses from the room. I'd like to ask you, when a slide like that comes up, and let's say that all the slides in the presentation have followed that similar format, when that slide comes up, what do you do as an audience member? And I'd like to get a few responses because people do a few different things. No, no right or wrong here, just what do you do? What do you do when this comes up? So it could be I either focus on the slide, ignore the speaker, or yep. so I'm just reading. And I've now blocked out everything, I'm scribbling down notes. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's one. Or so, I yeah. just block out the slide altogether just because there's just too much there. And I hope that the speaker Bigger. will distill it into something that's yeah. manageable. Good. So those are two major groups. So let's talk about group number one. So how many people generally will kind of dig into the slide and they sort of block out the speaker while they read the slide? How many people read the slide? Okay, that's about right. How many people, so I'm actually in the exact opposite group, so I won't bother with the slide and I'll just listen to the presenter. How many people do that? All right, so maybe those of you that haven't identified with either of those, you're probably in what I call tennis group, right? Which is back and forth, back and forth, where you skim a little bit of the slide, look for the key important ideas, you come back to the speaker, and then you go back, and so you're kind of trying to do this little dance between the two. And then the fourth group is cell phone group, right? Those are the, <laughs> I mean, those are the people that are just gone, right? They're, they're no longer with us. Now, <laughs> When you think about this, it doesn't matter at all what group you're in, but especially those first three where you're sort of trying to pay attention, those are all evidence of this first principle, which is that there is a limit to how much words-based information you can process. When you reach that limit, it's called cognitive overload. And what we just talked about in the room just now, that was you identifying how you experience cognitive overload and you automatically control for it. Because notice that nobody said that I simultaneously and harmoniously stream in both the words of the speaker and the words of the slide perfectly. And nobody ever says that. And that's because that's not how our brains are wired. Everybody says some form of, I turn off this, I bounce back to this, you know, so we're always controlling these flows. And that's because of this first principle, cognitive overload. So takeaway number one, there's a limit to the amount of words-based information we can process. When we reach that limit, when there's too many words, it's called cognitive overload. Principle two, if I have an unfamiliar technical term, and I tried to pick one that I thought maybe would be unfamiliar to you in this room. Do we have any mechanical engineers in the room? All right, you're going to know it, so you just pretend like you don't. All right, so if, if this unfamiliar technical term, if you're not a mechanical engineer, you might not be familiar with this one. This term is, is the word fillet. I know it looks like fillet, but Believe me, it's fillet. That's what the engineers talk about, it, all right? So this term is the word fillet. So if I'm trying to explain this unfamiliar term to you, I can say the word fillet. I could also project the word fillet and an accompanying definition on a slide. And as we just talked about, that's processed in the words-based part of the brain. And so what I'd like you to think about now is I'd like you to think about your audience as having a two-lane road into their brain. All right, that two-lane road is what you as a speaker can put information on to get to the brain of the audience. Now, lane number one is where the words information goes. And what's important here is that it does not matter whether you say the words and people hear them or whether they read them on the slide, words-based information is processed in roughly the same part of the brain. And cognitive overload, like we just talked about in that first principle, picture that as a traffic jam on the words-based lane. We have too many words and things are not getting through as efficiently as they could. Now, we've all had the experience of sitting in a traffic jam and seeing the other side of the road completely empty, right? Let's talk about that empty other side of the road. And this is the other way that we can get information to the brain of the audience, and that's the visual lane. And so if I'm trying to explain this term to you, Philip, I can talk about it, but I could also show you an accompanying relevant image. 
So fillets are interesting to me because they're a design feature used in engineering that's inspired by nature. So what fillets do is they help an object to move more efficiently through a fluid. And I think they're cool because what scientists, is that they're inspired actually by sharks. So a fillet is seen, it's that slant on the dorsal fin of the shark that you can see pictured there. And what scientists have observed is that over the course of evolution, the fillets on sharks have become more pronounced so that they can swim faster and catch more prey. And engineers use fillets on things like submarines, for example, to help those to move more efficiently through the water. Now, the work of Richard Mayer, who is the most published cognitive psychologist in the area of multimedia learning, his work would say that you are now twice as likely to remember this information because I showed you a relevant image to go along with it. And if we think about this, and you think about the situation of, let's say I ran into you a month from now, and I asked you, what's a fillet? What do you think, that'd be a weird conversation, admittedly, but uh, what, what do you think would be the first thing that you would think of? That's right. Your brain will think of the shark, and you will reconstruct the meaning of that word because of that image. Whereas if I had said, fillets are a design feature used by engineers, and then I had all the points about fillets, you wouldn't remember this at all. And so we also know this because most, uh, most languages have a phrase along the lines of, a picture is worth a thousand words. Right? This is something we deeply know as people to be true. All right, so that's the second principle. And so these two principles, just two, that I talked about, I hope are leading you to a conclusion. And that is, not only does the default of PowerPoint not work with the way our audience's brains are processing information, it actively runs against it. And what you should also know about those two principles that I shared with you is that, first of all, those are not controversial, and they're not that new. So I haven't, I mean, I haven't shared with you anything groundbreaking all right, at, this, at this stage. Hopefully I will soon. All right, but I haven't yet. And I say that because these are things in that field of cognitive psychology, which is a robust and very well-studied field. Certainly there's a lot we don't know about how the brain works, but there are some things we do know. So these are not controversial findings. 